distanced himself from that competition. With uh, me in studio, Matt Miller, the Hall of Famer, and former delegate John Doyle on the program. Gentlemen, I can't think of two better people to spend my Tuesday morning with in studio on June the 18th. July the 18th. I'm Matt, sorry. he's hard up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible way to react to that compliment, John. <laughs> terrible way. I, I, I loved it. <laughs> I feel like a turkey. We've just been basted there, a little butter. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> mm. You know, I've, I've said it before. Don't mention food on the program because uh, I haven't eaten since yesterday around dinner time. I'm sorry. All right. I, I forgot all about that. It's been so long since I've, I've been in and and seen you. It's good to good to be back. It's been a while. Again. You've yeah. been you've been out. I've been out. And now we go. Uh, I've meshed together again via telephone. A graduate of Elkins High School, candidate for Congress, the seat uh, currently held by Alex Mooney. He will not be running for re-election in that seat as he's running for U.S. Senate. Alex Gasserud. Alex, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Rob. Great to be with you today. Hope you're all doing well. Excellent. Uh, appreciate having you on the program here, uh, Alex. Uh, tell me, uh, you've just, you, I guess, declared for this office. We've had you on the program a couple of different times, and you've been making your way around the state, introducing yourself to people. How's it going? It's going well. Uh, our biggest challenge right now with our campaign is money. You know, we need money to be able to run an effective campaign. I've, I've spoken about that, I think, on your program the last two times I've been on. Um, but other than our lack of, of lack of money, we're, we're off to a great start. Our message is resonating. And I, I'll tell you, I don't know how many politicians in the country right now see their poll numbers go up uh, when they haven't raised any money. Now, we didn't go up a whole lot. We only went up a couple points. But, uh, you know, typically uh, going up in the polls with no money is, uh, is pretty rare. So, uh, we're going to continue to run this grassroots organization, this, uh, this campaign, and uh, get our message out. Our message is resonating. Uh, the generational change is resonating. And uh, where the country and the state of West Virginia is, you know, our, our plans, our solutions, and, and the problems that, that, that we're highlighting, it, it's definitely uh, connecting with people. So we're going to keep doing it. we got a lot of events coming up here in the next, uh, next month or so, some, some Lincoln Day dinners and door knocking and different, different activities. Alex, is the money an issue because one of your opponents, Riley Moore, is such a, a dominant candidate in name recognition and uh, also, of course, he's a constitutional officer in the state of West Virginia currently? Or is it that it's just a tough environment to raise money in right now? It's a little bit of both. You know, obviously, people are afraid to donate to campaigns when you're going against the more political family dynasty. So, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, are hesitant to donate because they don't want to be on the wrong side of Shelley. They don't want to be on the wrong side of, of Riley, you know, potentially. Uh, but it is also a very challenging environment to raise money. Uh, I think you're seeing that at, at the presidential level now and, and really down down races. It, it, it is a challenging environment, but uh, there really aren't any excuses. You know, I need to get out there and do a better job of raising money, uh, whether that's out of state or in state. So, uh, it's not so much the environment or, or some of the particulars that I mentioned, but, you know, it's, it's my responsibility to raise money as a candidate, and, and I haven't done that so far. So uh, without a donor base, it's, it's tough to run a race, uh, but we're, we're doing a good job of running a race without a donor base. I appreciate you doing some rhyming there. If this doesn't work out, a Dr. Seuss book is in your future. Though. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I really would like – you do that one segment there, what, on uh, Friday where you yes. – I don't think you write it, but you uh, – you, you, I'd like you to do one about me. Feel free. <laughs> oh, I definitely write them. Uh -huh. There's no – that's it's, it's sole ownership on that one there, buddy. Oh, you write them too? Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah. Those, that's my writing. That yeah. could only come from Rob's mind. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Alex, well, it's pick, obvious. Pick one up for me. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It's uh, uh, this is John. Hi. Uh, it's obvious that Rob writes him. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a compliment either, by the way. I, it, it, that was a neutral statement. All the nice things I said in that introduction, right there, too. Yeah, <laughs> that, was uh, a, that was a neutral statement. Alex, do you know uh, of, de of former delegate John Doyle, my co-host today, and his history in the West Virginia legislature? I have heard the name, but I'm not familiar with his service record or his history. I do apologize, John. Well, one little bit of history, which I think is probably important for this conversation, is that uh, Riley Moore and I ran against each other in 2018 uh, for the House of Delegates, and and uh, and and I won. 
Uh, so oh, just, I do. Yes, that's the, oh, you're that John Doyle. Okay, I'm yes, that I, John Doyle. I, yes, yeah. Okay, that, and, and that's the way most people greet him. By the way, uh, so you're that John Doyle. <laughs> yes, yes, right. <laughs> well, which 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 uh, is a good segue, uh, Alex. What what what? Uh, uh, how do you distinguish yourself from Riley? Because he is clearly, uh, at the moment anyway, the front runner in the race. And if you're going to overtake him. You're going to need to uh, uh, explain the differences between the two of you in a way that the voters will choose you. Well, I'm not uh, from a political family dynasty, so there's a big difference right off the bat. You know, West Virginia, as we know, has struggled for decades as long as I've been alive and, and before I was alive. And if we continue to trust the same names uh, to make this state uh, a great state or to push the country where it needs to go, I think we're going to be you know, disappointed. Uh, so that's the first differential right away. You know, I, I'm not of the political class. I don't have a political family that, that has been you know, in, in power and what have you. So that's the first you know, differential right there. Um, the second differential, you know, I, I don't want to get overly personal, but you know, I didn't dress up as a punk rocker and had an alternate personality talking about sexually explicit lyrics and drug use and that sort of thing. I didn't, you know, the Rick Rattler thing, that, that to me is, you know, I, I'm not sure how that's really possible. But um, and, and then obviously I'm a generational change. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit younger. So I think we need to send people that aren't involved in the political class. That's the first differential. But I don't have a public office track record to really highlight a lot of differences. I'm sure me and Riley would agree on a lot of issues. Don't get me wrong. Um, intellectually and, conser and, and on cons a conservative basis. Um, but w the main difference is we cannot have the same people and the same names running a state that continues to fail. So I, I, I kind of want to see a, an outsider, and, and, and I think I have the ability to do it, and, and uh, I, I definitely you know, want to keep running this race. Well, Alex, are there any issues uh, that you would uh, differentiate yourself uh, uh, from Riley with? Besides the punk rock thing. <laughs> no, no, I'm, oh, no rock. I, I meant public policy issues. <laughs> Just, you know, there are hundreds of issues that, that we all talk about when we run for office. And, and are there any that you believe uh, distinguishes you from Riley Moore? Yes. I don't hear Riley giving any full-throat defense on the border crisis. I haven't heard anything from him about what he would do in Congress from a solution base to, to, to get after the border. Um, I, I really the only thing I hear from Riley in the course of this campaign is ESG. And and I agree with him on some some stances with the ESG. I also think that's something that's going to be well out of his purview. He's not going to be able to bully people in Washington like he did on the investment management board. But at the same time, you know, I want him to, to be out there and to, you know, there's a reason that I'm where I'm at with no track record and no money. It's because of my message. And it's resonating, and people hear the passion, they hear the ideas, they hear the solution, and they want that. I haven't heard anything from that, Riley. Whether it's you know allowing the the, the the international community to push the United States around, and I don't hear him talking about the war in Ukraine. What's his stance on the war in Ukraine? What's his stance on on uh, Cuba right now uh, being set up as a surveillance state for the Chinese? What's what, your what, stance? What's his opinion? On, yeah. yeah so. What's oh, Alex? What's your stance on the war in Ukraine? I think that we should tread very lightly. We cannot afford to give blank checks to Ukraine. I believe Ukraine is a klepto state. It is a corrupt state. And the United States cannot physically afford to continue to fund this war in Ukraine. And I also don't believe, unless Chinese and Iranian boots go on the ground, that Russia has the military capability to occupy Ukraine. I just don't believe it. And I don't believe that without American boots on the ground, Ukraine will be able to move the needle and defeat the Russian aggression. So I don't want to mortgage my children's future and potentially their grandchildren's future and continue to add to a 31 plus trillion dollar debt in a conflict that I don't think can be won. There are not going to be any winners in this. Well, you and I do and, disagree. You and I do disagree there. I think it is critical for in, in, for the national security of the United States for Ukraine to defeat Russia, plain and simple. That's my view. 
I, but I you're not running it's... against me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, hey, John, I, I, I hear you. And I'm not with the traditional conventional foreign policy on this. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I have a thesis that, um, you know, Ukraine falling is not going to create adverse reactions for European partners in the United States specifically. There's a lot of conventional foreign policy wisdom that disagrees with that. But that's the same conventional foreign policy wisdom that was all for the, the conflicts in the Middle East. And the same conventional foreign policy with the, with the war in Vietnam. And, and we actually, you know, just to push back a little bit more before we move on, we've seen NATO strengthen. Now, some can say, well, that's because the U.S. has supported Ukraine. Um, but I, I don't believe it. I think NATO is strengthened because the Swedes and, and, and the Finns are just scared. Now, uh, you mentioned Vietnam, and I want to point out uh, to you and, and to all of our listeners who may not be aware that our co-host John Doyle did pick up a rifle and serve in Vietnam where he led men in combat. So just want to make sure. John, thank you for your service. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I was a rifle platoon leader, and, uh, and uh, I'm just happy to be here. We're, we're happy you survived <laughs> it, sir. Matt yeah, Miller. Oh, go ahead, Alex. I'm sorry. Finish up. No, go ahead. I just want to tell John, thank you for your service. Alex, uh, as far as uh, some of those topics that you mentioned, uh, tell us more about where you stand with the border crisis and the things that are going on along our southern border. Yeah, you know, other than the runaway debt and the out-of-control spending in Washington, this is really my big issue. Um, we have got to put America first, and we have got to secure the southern border. Uh, the effects of the southern border are just not economical and unconstitutional. It's not my responsibility or any other taxpayer's responsibility to be putting illegal aliens and, and, and asylum seekers in hotel rooms. Uh, it's also creating an adverse effect in the United States where we have our own children, our own young adults, and even older adults that are dying because of the proliferation of the fentanyl crisis, which is a direct result of a wide open border. And just to get to the, the founders on this, it is a violation of our social contract to allow this invasion on the southern border and the northern border. So what I want to do is get the military there immediately because it's Congress's responsibility to, to, to declare war, not the president's, even though that's the world we've been living in really post LBJ. But it's, it's the responsibility of the Congress, and we have got to get there, and whether it's Riley or it's me or it's anyone else, we have got to craft legislation that sends the military to the border to secure it. We have got to end the asylum program immediately, and we have to form a mass deportation task force. We are not going to be able with the five to six that have come over, million that have come over illegally, but that number is probably more around nine to ten million. All of those people cannot stay, and we have to enforce the sovereignty of the United States, and we have to enforce the rule of law, and we're not doing that. And it's crippling our country, not only economically, but socially. So uh, there's all kinds of, of reasons why the border, in my opinion, is the most important issue right now. And Ukraine is, 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 is not first. But for this administration, everybody else in the world is being put first, and Americans are being put last. They're laughing at mothers that are losing children to the fentanyl crisis, which is a direct result of a wide-open southern border. Do you feel that it's going to be a challenge um, to get other uh, congressmen and women to kind of come to that side or, or to agreement on some of those ways and areas that you believe maybe this uh, should be um, attacked as far as this crisis? Or do you feel like, you know, there are enough already in the Congress that that can jump on board and, and we can tackle this issue quickly? With the slim majority... No. We're going to have to expand our numbers in the U.S. House. We're going to have to win the Senate. We're going to have to win the presidency to be able to actually employ that policy solution. Uh, so, so there's a lack of will, I think, among politicians in this nation writ large. And, and, and it's very disappointing for somebody that has followed and studied the founders like I have. Uh, it's very disappointing to see the lack of political will to stand up now and to fight for what it is to be an American and American values. Uh, so whether it's reducing government and cleaning out the three-letter agencies and getting rid of people to work in government and just reducing government writ large, there's going to be a lack of will. Sending the military to the border to secure the border, there's going to be a lack of will. Standing up to foreign nations, there's a lack of will. 
But I, I think if we start electing the, the right people that are about putting and restoring this American republic and honoring the rule of law, then it won't be as difficult. But but right now the answer is yes, it will be difficult. But that's that's what leadership takes. Leadership is difficult. And, yeah. and, and it's easy to talk from the sidelines until you get in the game a little bit and things change. But we have to elect people that have the mindset that I have. Alex, uh, speaking of the right people, do you have a choice uh, for the Republican nomination for president? Yes, I'm supporting Donald Trump. Okay. Uh, Donald Trump stood up and fought for the American people and showed us in 2016 how corrupt the system and the game really is. And I'm going to stand up now and support and fight for Donald. Uh, so that's my pick. That's my first, second, third, fourth, and fifth pick. Um, West Virginians overwhelmingly uh, support Donald Trump, and I do as well. So uh, as long as Donald Trump is, is a, a free man and running for office uh, and he's on the, the ballot uh, come May 14th, 2024, I will be casting my ballot for Donald Trump, and, 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 and I obviously endorse Donald Trump. Alex, how would you? Oh, good, man. I'm no, sorry. Go. Alex, how would you have voted on the infrastructure bill? I believe uh, Manchin and Capito voted for it. Uh, Mooney and Miller voted against it, if I have that uh, recollection. Uh, but uh, this is the same bill that uh, currently is pouring uh, millions and millions of dollars into West Virginia for uh, broadband expansion. Yeah, you know, the broadband expansion, I really wish our lawmakers, Senator Capito included, would wait until the state is wired to start talking about this. We had a disaster with, with broadband funds and, and, and actually the, the, the infrastructure being laid for broadband connectivity, uh, you know, about a decade ago. So once the state's wired, that's when I wish they would come out and start taking credit. But, of course, typical fashion here, they're trying to take credit before – anybody's even been connected. Um, I would have been voting against the infrastructure bill, uh, as, as Congressman Mooney did. Um, and I, I say that even though a lot of federal dollars have poured into West Virginia and it is going to help us with our infrastructure, which we know is last in the nation, uh, we have got to stand up for physical conservatism in Washington, D.C. I believe there was too much waste in that bill uh, for me to be able to support it completely. Um, so I, I would have been voting against it, uh, but I know that it is bringing some impact to the state. Uh, it, it is a very tough issue, obviously. If you would have voted yeah, against it, I, re I respect your your uh, right to vote for or against any bill, of course. Uh, but uh, in voting against it, how would you then alternately propose expanding West Virginia's broadband, which once expanded, I presume, will also lead toward the attractiveness of the state for new businesses? Hopefully that's the case. Um, again, I, I don't believe the federal government is responsible for connecting the state of West Virginia. I believe the state of West Virginia is responsible for connecting the state. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, I, I just think the bill was too big. I'm not necessarily against the broadband funding. I'm just against the bill in its entirety because it was just it was so massive. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's, it's the state's responsibility to connect itself and, and – uh, and we need to, you know, find a way to do that, obviously. So, again, I'm small government. You know, you're, I, I'm not signing up for all these spending bills. And, and, and you know, that's, that's how I feel about it. I want to connect this through the decades then, and this is going to be kind of difficult to put yourself back in that time, but then would you have also voted against the Eisenhower expansion of the interstate highway system in America if you were a, a person who was in Congress at that time? Because I view these as the same thing. Uh, it's just a yeah. different highway today. It's an interstate highway as opposed to, to an Internet highway. And that's a strong argument, Rob. You know, definitely, definitely hear your argument on that. I, you know, I obviously wasn't around them. But, yeah, I, I would have been supporting that. That that was that allowed the entire nation to prosper together. Um, we had our shot at connecting the state before. And we're one of the last states to be connected. I mean, it, you know, it's not like. The rest of the country is in the same position of West Virginia, and we're having to build a massive uh, Internet, uh, figuratively speaking, highway. Uh, we're one of the last states that isn't connected in, in, the, in the country. And, you know, again, uh, is that 
the federal government's responsibility. I don't know. If every state wasn't connected, maybe it is a federal issue. But, again, we're one of the last states not to have connectivity. You can go to virtually any other state, and you don't run into any of these sorts of connectivity issues. And our leaders failed to implement connectivity about 10 years ago when every other state was getting connected. So I just want to see us connected and then hear everybody take credit for it and they can, you know, but, but of course they're trying to take credit for it before anyone's been connected. So I think, again, we're pulling the cart before the horse. Uh, but of course I would have been supporting the, 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 uh, the highway system under, you know, Eisenhower. Uh, and, and I think I've given you a little bit of a reason there why it, it, it was lifting the entire nation up as opposed to just us kind of out here still not connected in the 21st century. Uh, but Alex, a large part of the infrastructure bill is physical highways like particularly quarter H. I mean, I think most people believe that were it not for this infrastructure bill, we would not know how we were going to finish quarter H. And I don't know whether you're in favor of quarter H or opposed to it, but but it seems like to me that if you would have been in favor of the interstate highway system, you would have been in, in favor of the highways that are going to be built under this infrastructure bill. We should have finished quarter H 20 years ago. As a state, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a, what is the responsibility? Is the responsibility of the federal government or is the responsibility of the individual state? I believe the responsibility to finish highways, to fix bridges, primarily lies with states, not with the federal government, especially with a federal government that is so far behind now where we've just printed money with reckless abandonment now since really 2008, and there's no end in sight. And, and that's why Mooney voted against it, because – at some point, we have to stand up and say no, and it might cost us a bridge. It might cost us connecting a highway. It might cost us getting broadband in very remote rural areas of the state. But that's the price that we're going to have to pay to rein in the out-of-control, ridiculous spending. But, but, the, but co- the country made this decision back in the 1920s uh, uh, yeah. during the Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover administrations that highways, in order to work – uh, have to be done nationally. Corridor H is going through two states, West Virginia and Virginia. If you have each state making its own decision, you might end up with something like somebody's ready to drive the golden spike and and the end of the highway in one state is four or five miles away from the end of the highway in the other state. There's got to be some coordination here. Sure. There's definitely a role for the federal government, but I, w- uh, again, would if that was just separate, and maybe we would look at it, but it was it was part of a much larger spending spree, like every other bill is. So, you know, we're going to agree to disagree on this. Okay, Matt Miller, <laughs> Alex, take us into a little bit of your background as as you run for a, a pretty high office. Um, what is the background that you believe has you ready and prepared for this particular role? I've always had a natural calling for public service and for office. Uh, I have been a student of politics and American history, world history for a long time. Um, I have a certain debate. You know, I, I was in debate in college, so I have a, a, a way of verbally defending myself. I also have a way of, of getting the truth out of people. So uh, I have a natural ability for this. That's, that's why I've decided to enter now. And, and another reason I decided to enter was because I couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore with my abilities and watch our country continue to fail, watch our state continue to fail, and it's time now to stand up. Is this a big step? Sure. Is this an audacious office uh, of running for it? Of course. Uh, But I wouldn't be out here running for this office if I didn't believe I had the ability. And and I I think that voters that I've connected with uh, since December of 2022 uh, understand that as well. This is something that I have always planned on doing, and uh, because of the state of the country and the state of West Virginia, I decided now was the time to get into it. If this, and we see, and, and again, we're in a different era, guys. You know, thirty years ago, even twenty years ago, heck, even twelve, fifteen years ago, a candidacy like mine would have been squashed from the very beginning. Um, but in the post-Trump world, we are in a different political environment. And American first outsiders with no track record are representing constituents across the country in Washington, D.C. every cycle now. 
if this opportunity does not go the way that you would like for it to go, is this an open door then to say, now, okay, let me focus maybe to the state level and uh, an office in the state level that might allow me to help West Virginia? Yes. Yes, potentially. This is, this is kind of my entrance into West Virginia politics and in American politics. And if this race doesn't go the way that I want it to go, um, then there will be a political future for me. I can't lose in this situation. Um, we're going to continue to connect with people. We're going to continue to fight for the state, fight for the country. And uh, I look to be on the scene in, in politics in this state and, and hopefully in the country for the rest of my life. Well, Alex, I'm a big fan of young people getting involved. And I know you're 30, but that's still young to everybody in this room. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of uh, young people getting involved uh, in politics. So uh, good for you for taking the step forward. Uh, how can people find out more about your campaign? You can follow me at my last name, which is a tough one, uh, Gasseru, that's G-A-A-S-E-R-U-D, the number 4-W-V.com. Um, and you're welcome to get information there. We've got a number you can call, uh, and, and we look forward to hearing from anybody that would, would like to get a hold of us. They can also email us directly at gasserud 4 wv at gmail.com. All right, Alex, thank you so much. You mentioned uh, Riley Moore's alter ego, Ricky Rattler, so I'm going to send you out with some punk rock music from Sid Vicious. 